Thank you so much for the introduction. As Ravi said, I'm Juliet Brooks, and I'm a new postdoc at uh, the University of California, Berkeley. But for the year, I am also in residence at MSRI. Um, and today, I'm going to talk about the top weight cohomology of the moduli space of abelian varieties. And this is all joint work with Madeline Brandt, Melody Chan, Margarita Mello, Gwen Moreland, and Corey Wolf. And all began um, thanks to some great organizing work um, from people whose names I can't remember right now at the Women in Algebraic Geometry Workshop at ICERN. And so throughout this talk, the central player is going to be AG, which is the moduli space of principally polarized abelian varieties of dimension G. So if you'd like, an abelian variety is just a projective variety with a group structure where the group operations are given by regular maps. And AG is some space whose points parameterize this all possible abelian varieties of dimension G together with this um, extra structure called a principal polarization. And um, just to tell you a little bit, one small fact about the space that will come up later. So the dimension of AG is g plus one choose two. And throughout the talk, I'll often refer to that as d. So if you see a d somewhere, um, it likely is referring to the dimension of ag, i.e. g plus one choose two. And um, so that's the main player. And the question that I want to focus, that motivates this talk, I think, in some ways, is the following question of Krzyzewski. from 2009, which as far as I know is still open, um, which is does AG have odd cohomology for some G? So is there, a, is there a, some G for which the moduli space of abelian varieties of dimension G has a non-trivial odd cohomology group? Um, and whenever I talk about cohomology today, I'm going to be talking about rational cohomology. Um, and so what was known, what was or is known about the cohomology of AG? So on well, the one hand, quite a bit is known about the cohomology of AG. On the other hand, in the direction of this question, I think um, rel not as much is known as we might expect. So some of the previous results that I'll mention, although certainly this is in no way exhaustive, and there are many others I should probably mention, but won't for lack of time. So in 1962, Agusa um, computed the cohomology of A2 and showed that it was concentrated in degrees 0 and 2 um, so for A2, there is no odd cohomology. 40 years later, Hain in 2002 computed the cohomology of A3 and showed that it was concentrated in degrees uh, 0, 2, 4, And six. So again, no odd cohomology of A3. And I should mention that Hain did a little bit more and actually computed the full mixed Hobbs structure on A3. Um, and this is kind of the only two cases that I'm aware of where we actually fully understand the cohomology ring of AG. Um, there was a much other, a lot of other work done, kind of studying the cohomology of various compactifications or studying the stable cohomology or studying. Um, the virtual cohomological dimension or things of that sort, but directly approaching Grzeszewski's question of does there exist an odd cohomology group of AG, I think these, as far as I know, are the two main results in this direction, which would suggest the answer to the question should be no, there is no odd cohomology, but there's also the following result of Tomasi from 2005 which says that H5 of M4, so not the moduli space of abelian varieties, but the moduli space of genus 4 curves, 
is isomorphic to Q. So AG might not have odd cohomology, but M4 definitely has one odd cohomology group. So if there's odd cohomology for MG, we might hope there's odd cohomology for AG um, and because they're very closely connected via the Torelli map and many other ways. Um, so I think this is maybe why this is a question, not a conjecture, because we might expect there to be odd cohomology given Tomasi's result. But I also think it turns out to be quite difficult to find non-trivial odd cohomology groups for moduli spaces in algebraic geometry because we're working over the complex numbers. And so most of our standard geometric techniques would produce things that naturally live in even dimension. Um, so in fact, as far as I'm aware, this um, cohomology group right here was the only known odd cohomology class for either AG or MG up until about a year, year and a half ago, when work of Sam Payne, Melody Chan, and Soren Galatis managed to produce three more examples for MG. So as far as I know, um, until what I'm about to tell you, there are four known odd cohomology classes for MG or AG. And the main result of our, the work that I want to talk about today is the following theorem, which gives us a number of new odd cohomology classes. So it's a theorem and it's of myself, Madeline Brandt, Melody Chan, Margarita Mello, Gwen Moreland, and Corey Wolf. And what it says, if G is between two and seven inclusive, then the top weight cohomology of AG is zero, except in a number of cases, and those cases are first, um, the top weight cohomology of A3 is non-zero when Q, when K is six. So this recovers the work we saw of Hain, or I guess not recovers, this recovers the fact we knew from Hain. The top weight cohomology of A5 is non-trivial when K is 15 or 20. The top weight cohomology of A6 is non-zero non when K is 30. And finally, the top weight cohomology of a7 is non-trivial when k is 28, 33, 37, and 42. Okay, so let's unpack this for a minute. So what are we, what, are, what, is, what am I saying we've done? So I'm saying in the range two to seven, we've fully computed the top weight cohomology of the moduli space of Abelian varieties. And what is the top weight cohomology? Well, by Deling's theory of weight, uh, mixed hot structures, there's a weight filtration that goes from degrees zero up to 2D, where D again is the dimension of AG. And I'm calling the weight piece in degree 2D the top weight piece. Um, if you prefer to not think about um, Hodge theory at all, what you can really just think about what is, why this is important is that there is a canonical quotient essentially from the, from the cohomology of AG to the top um, weight cohomology of AG. So I should say that 
GRW lower number is going to be the top weight cohomology. And so it's a canonical quotient of the cohomology of AG. So in particular, if the top weight cohomology is non-zero, then the cohomology in that respective degree is also going to be non-zero. So what that tells us is, well, here we have a 15, a 33, and a 37. And so those, there are three new non-trivial odd cohomology classes in these degrees. And so this answers uh, the question. So this gives an answer of yes to the question. Okay, great. So great, we've computed the co top weight cohomology of AG in a new range some, um, and found, answered this question and found some odd cohomology. That's great. But what I really like to think is a story here and what I really think is interesting about this question is not necessarily finding a particular odd cohomology class. I'm not sure how um, intriguing it would be if we knew there just one existed somewhere, but really it's kind of a motivation to new, develop new techniques for studying the cohomology of AG and other moduli spaces that allows us to find these classes. And um, the work I want to talk about the rest of the day really is in this vein of how do we go about proving this theorem, what kind of goes into the proof. Um, and the main result in that direction is the following theorem. Do again to myself, Madeline Brandt, Melody Chan, Margarita Mello, Gwen Moreland, and Corey Wolf, who I will not write all their names this time for <laughs> sake of brevity, which says that there exists a chain complex that we call the perfect chain complex, and we denote it by P upper G dot such that there is a canonical isomorphism between the homology of this chain complex and the top, the top weight cohomology of AG. Okay. So what is this theorem saying? I'm saying there's some very explicit chain complex, complex that turns is combinatorially defined in essence, whose homology exactly computes these top weight graded cohomology groups. Um, and so how do we go from the, the second theorem to the first? Well, we use some existing work in the literature and a lot of other techniques to actually write down these chain complexes from G between two and seven and compute um, homology of it, and that gives us the result. And I can, maybe if I have time, I'll say a few brief words about that in a, at the end, but really I want to focus the rest of my time on what exactly is this chain complex, this perfect chain complex, and what, where is this isomorphism coming from? Because I think this is maybe the more interesting aspect of the talk, namely kind of what is this new method for getting at these cohomology groups? What's new here? And I should say that really this fits into a broader pattern of um, kind of recent work of Payne, Gladys, and Chan about using combinatorics and tropical geometry to understand moduli spaces. Okay, so are there any questions right now before I move on? Well, in, in the end, you say that these cohomology groups are non-zero. Are you actually able to compute them? Um, the top weight cohomology groups? Yeah. Yeah, um, so we are explicitly, so we use other results of other people who have computed essentially cohomology of a chain complex analogous to PG and are able to show that that implies the cohomology groups of, our, of this complex PG is non-trivial. So we're ex essentially able and, and in some cases able to explicitly compute the cohomology of this chain complex. So the answer, so the answer to the question then is sometimes, but not always, like you, you know non-zero-ness, but you don't know how non-zero it is sometimes, is that right? Um, Yes, I think so. Okay. Okay. And, then did, and then did you say earlier that, um, uh, so the, originally it was Sam Wyshevsky's question that there was, is there any odd cohomology? And you said, we still don't know. I thought that you meant until now, until- Until now, I mean, until I told until you- Until two minutes ago. Good. Until two, I guess, know. okay, I knew, but maybe you didn't know, I guess. <laughs> Good, okay, just wanted to make sure I wasn't confused and now yes. I see, now I'm, okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes. Yes. Um, yes. So, um, yeah. So, switching back to what I was saying, right? So, the goal is to kind of understand what is this chain complex, right? And so, the chain complex is defined combinatorially. So, it'll take a while to get there. But I, some of the central players that will go into defining it. So, I'm going to let omega g be the set of g by g positive definite um, quadratic forms. defined over the real numbers. And I want to think about this as being a subset of the space of G by G symmetric matrices. So I have a big vector space of symmetric matrices, G by G symmetric matrices. And inside of this space, I have the set omega G, which is going to be a cone, I'm drawing this wrong, of a positive definite symmetric quadratic forms. Okay, so this is omega g. And so this cone is definitely not polyhedral. It's convex, but not polyhedral. And it's open. If we took its closure, we'd get the cone of all um, positive semi-definite quadratic forms. Um, but that turns out to be too much for our purposes. So instead of taking the full closure, we're going to be interested in what's called the rational closure. Um, which we, which is the following set. So omega g r t, which is the rational closure, it's going to be the set of g by g positive semi-definite quadratic forms defined over the real numbers with rational kernel. So I, what I mean exactly is that if I take this quadratic form and I look at its kernel, I can find a basis for the kernel consisting of vectors that are actually rational. So all the vectors have rational entries. Um, and so this is how I like to think about this is instead of, is that we're not fully closing up the cone, but we're kind of adding a very dense subset of points kind of along the boundary and filling in a lot of the gaps that were originally in our cone. In particular, we get to throw in the cone point, right? The cone point corresponds to the zero matrix, and that definitely has rational kernels, so we get to throw in the cone point. And so omega GRT is this not closed, non-polyhedral, but convex cone. It turned out to be the right object for study for us. And if you think it's weird that I only threw in kind of these things with rational kernel, the best motivation I can give for you is that somehow we're working about moduli spaces. And if you remember the construction of M11 bar, the things you have to throw in along kind of the boundary of the half plane for M11 bar are exactly those points with rational entries. So somehow that's what we're doing here um, by way of vague analogy. Okay, and so one thing I'll note before moving on is that there's a natural action on, on this cone. So in particular, the set of G by G invertible matrices with integer entries acts on this cone by doing A blank A transpose, right? So um, if you've seen quadratic forms, this action might be natural. It's kind of how we consider quadratic forms to be equivalent. And it's going to be very important throughout the rest of this talk. And so I've mentioned a couple times that this cone is not polyhedral and that we want to do something combinatorial. And so um, we essentially want to try find a way to approximate this cone with a combinatorial set of objects um, that respect this action nicely. And so this leads to the definition of a so-called immiscible decomposition. So a, an immiscible decomposition of omega g r t is a collection of rational polyhedral
cones. And I call this collection capital sigma. And I'm going to call the cones in this collection little sigma. So little sigma will always be a rational polyhedral cone. And this collection of cones has to satisfy some properties. So first, sigma has to cover omega GRT. So if I union all of the cones in my collection, I get omega GRT. Note that this means that sigma is necessarily going to be infinite because we can't cover a, a non-polyhedral cone with finitely many polyhedral cones in this way. Um, two, the sigma has to be play well with respect to cone operations. So sigma is closed under intersections and faces. So if you give me a cone in capital sigma and you take a face of that cone, those, that cone also has to be in sigma. And if you take two cones in capital sigma and intersect them, that intersection has to be a face and also in sigma itself. Okay, so great. And then third, it has to respect the action of GLGZ. So if I have a matrix A and a cone in sigma, then A sigma, A transpose also has to be sigma. So it might not fix my cones exactly, but it has to permute them around in the set. So as an entire set of cones, um, it's closed under the action of GLGZ. And finally, up to this action, there are only finitely many uh, GLGZ orbits, right? Okay, so how I, how I like to think about these in particular, right, is I'm saying I have this um, non-polyhedral cone and I want to cover it by polyhedral cones that behave well with GLGZ. So in particular, how I think about it is you, I'm going to specify kind of a finite number of polyhedral cones, something maybe like this, and then I start letting GLGZ act. And as I do that, GLGZ is going to start moving these cones around. Maybe it takes this cone over here to something like this, and it starts tessellating this big non-polyhedral cone in a very fractal-like pattern. And eventually, after letting all of the action run, I'm going to have covered the entire thing from this finite starting set. Um, OK, so um, this is maybe a slightly strange definition at first. So let me give you an example of such a thing. And so it seems like a reason, I mean, I was waiting to see if you, there's like a surprise in your list, but I see no surprises. It's like the re only reasonable thing. I, that. I, it, it might be, I mean, it's okay. So it's reasonable. There are no surprises, but I think if you've never seen anything like this, you might not know why I'm doing this. Um, okay, so. Um, Um, so the example I want to talk about is called the perfect cone decomposition. And it's essentially a recipe for a, get, it, a recipe that takes in a quadratic form and spits out a cone. And so the input is going to be going to let Q be a positive definite quadratic form. And then I'm going to let M of Q be the set of integer vectors that are non-zero that minimize Q when I restrict Q to the lattice. Right, so what I'm saying here is, in essence, I'm looking at the shortest vectors with respect to the quadratic form Q. Um, and then, so this gives me a set of vectors in Z, Z to the G. I'm going to form a cone of those by taking sigma of Q, let, letting that be the cone whose rays exactly are X, X transpose, where X is one of these vectors of shortest length. So 
They take my set M of Q and I do XX transpose to form a rank one quadratic form. And I look at the cone spanned by these finitely many rays. Okay, so this gives me a cone and the perfect- Actually, actually we've got a question uh, yeah. from the peanut gallery. Uh, the, uh, oh, actually, I, I, I now don't want to use that phrase, but uh, how are quadratic forms related to abelian varieties? So great question. Um, and I think the short answer is that in my head, they're essentially what a principal polarization is. So um, if you want to form the moduli space of abelian varieties, we should really be thinking about doing, um, taking the, the space of quadratic forms and quotienting by something and essentially the condition of specifying a pot of a um, principal polarization is specifying a positive definite uh, imaginary part of a matrix that gives you um, kind of the positive, the uh, principal polarization. So that might be a good answer, a bad answer if you've never seen principal polarizations, but um, I can say more about that later if you would like. Okay, so here I give, we have a recipe that takes in a cone or takes in a quadratic form and spits out a cone. And then the perfect cone decomposition, which is gonna be an immiscible decomposition is, which I'm gonna denote omega P lower G is gonna be the set of sigma of Q as I run over all possible positive definite quadratic forms. Okay, so great, this is a recipe. And now we have to check that it's in fact an immiscible decomposition. So it satisfies the four axioms I just slid off the screen. Um, but luckily we don't have to do that because back in 1909, 1908, Voronoi checked it for us. So, in 1908, Voronoi showed that sigma upper P lower G is in fact an admissible decomposition. And Voronoi, as far as I'm aware, definitely wasn't interested in the moduli space of abelian varieties in any way, but instead was interested in lattices and um, kind of the theory of quadratic forms in which this cone naturally arises. Um, and so, in some ways, I think it's amazing that this question of the moduli space of abelian varieties really is connected to many disparate areas of very beautiful mathematics. Okay, so um, let's do an example. So the example is gonna be when G equals two. And so I have to start with a quadratic form and the quadratic form I'm gonna start is one, one half on the off diagonals which corresponds to the polynomial x squared plus xy plus y squared. And the first thing I have to do is find the minimal vectors of this. So um, did anyone do any of the warm-up exercises and find the minimal vectors of this? You said there wouldn't be a test. Okay, that's fair. I said there wasn't going to be a test, so I'll just tell you them, but they're in the warm-up. So the minimum of this on the lattice is going to be one, and you can check that the minimal vectors are going to be plus or minus the standard basis. And then uh, plus or minus kind of where the chord one comma minus one. So as long as the sign is different, we get a minimal vector. So these are our six minimal vectors. And we then want to look at all the rank one matrices we get by doing this times the transpose of itself. And so sigma of Q is going to be the cone spanned by one, zero, 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 one, and one minus one minus one, one. Okay, so this is my cone. So the one great thing about G equals three is I'm looking at two by two symmetric matrices. So I'm in R3. So I can imagine my cone by just taking a coordinate, a hyperplane slice of it. It's going to be kind of given by a picture on R2. So I can actually draw this cone. And let me quickly scroll down and steal my picture from later. 
and magically on our screen, the cone has appeared. Um, so this is the cone omega 2 rg. So I have this very non-convex cone, this circle kind of out here. And inside of it, I have the rays given by this matrix, this matrix, and this matrix, which are going to find a three-dimensional cone here, which is the one we just saw. And in, in, in theory, I would now have to compute all of the other cones for all of the other positive definite quadratic forms. But if you do a little bit of work, you can show that up to the action of GL2z, this is the only cone that's going to appear in the perfect cone decomposition. So here's my one cone, and if I start letting GL2 act, it's going to flip over and give me this cone, and then it's going to flip over and give me this cone, and flip and kind of tessellate this entire region. So this is the picture for GL2. Um, there's one up to the action of GLGZ. There's one unique cone given by the so-called principal quadratic form. Okay, and that's great. And so now I'm almost ready to tell us what this plus the plus the faces plus the faces yes i mean they also come from quadratic forms yes i have to also take the faces you're absolutely right um, um so i'm almost ready to kind of veer back from our diversion into kind of combinatorics and quadratic form to say what is this chain complex p upper g but i need one more definition and so that is the definition uh, where we say a cone sigma is alternating if for whenever I have, if given a matrix A in GLGZ that stabilizes sigma, so A sigma A transpose is equal to sigma then the action of A is orientation preserving on sigma. So what do I mean? So I have this matrix that's going to act on my cone and it fixes the cone as a set, which means it induces a map from sigma to itself as a map of topological spaces. And that map of topological spaces has to be um, orientation preserving. So if it is, we call such cones alternating. Okay, so now I think I have everything to actually define the complex. So let's do that now. So the so-called perfect complex P upper G lower dot is the chain complex where, okay, so in degree K, it's going to be the vector space spanned by the GLGZ orbits of alternating cones in the perfect cone decomposition um, with the dimension of my cone being k plus 1. So up to the action of GLGZ, I have a finite number of cones. And I count how many of those have dimension k plus 1. And amongst those, I ask how many of those are alternating. And they put all of those alternating cones as a basis for this vector space in degree k of my chain complex. And what does the map do? So the differential sigma k, it's going to take in a cone and it's going to spit out a sum of minus one to some something that I'll say a bit about in a second times tau, where tau is a facet of sigma. Okay, and so what should the sign here be? Well, it should be exactly what you need to make this a chain complex is one answer. The second slightly better answer is it's the sign you normally see in topology when you need to make something a chain complex, a cellular complex. 
or a bet, even the better answer is you fix a reference orientation on all the cones and you say tau gets sine plus one if the induced orientation from sigma agrees with the reference orientation and it gets minus one if the induced orientation from sigma disagrees with the reference orientation on tau. Okay, so you define your chain complex this way and it takes some work to show that this will in fact be a chain complex. Um, but I'm not going to prove that here. Instead, let's do an example. So continuing the example of G equals two. Okay, let me pull up my next picture. Okay, so in G equals two, the chain complex I'm looking at is going to be supported in degrees um, P2, P1, P0, and P minus one. Okay, and so what I have to do is first write down a basis from each of these things. So I have to say how many cones up to the action of GLG, GL2Z do I have that have dimension three that don't have an orientation reversing uh, action of GL2Z. Well, there was only one cone of dimension three up to the action of GL2Z, namely this one here. And I claim it's not alternating because if there's an element of GL2Z that's going to reflect it across this red line. So it's gonna take this point down to here and fix this current point, which is definitely going to be orientation reversing. So in degree two, my chain complex here is zero. We do the same thing. We ask how many faces, two dimensional cones do I have? It turns out if you did the warm up exercise or you can show that up to the action of GL2Z, there's only going to be one such thing. So I've drawn it here in purple. Um, and we ask, is this alternating or not? But by the same argument, we know it's not going to be alternating because that same element of GL2Z is going to flip it amongst itself and kind of mirror everything over. So, so, so can, I, uh, can I ask, is, um, so if, if we were confused by the symmetries, you could just further subdivide uh, to make the edges no longer map to themselves and do weird things, I guess, right? And then, but then at the price of it getting more, comp more computationally complicated and then it's maybe not implementable in a computer. Yes, so I think you can always, so you can always take a further subdivision of your cone and I think that will, you can write down a similar chain complex and it should all work well, I believe, um, but I think it will be more complicated. Although that comes up in a very crucial way that I'm probably going to hide. So if you want to know more about it, ask me in 10 minutes. Okay, so then there's two more left to do. We ask how many cones of dimension one do we have? Well, again, the warm up exercise where you can check that there's exactly a one of them. So I'm going to pick this single ray to be my uh, orbit. And we ask, is it alternating? Well, sure, there aren't any, the ray can't get flipped around in any weird ways because the cone point is always going to be fixed. So in degree zero, this chain complex is generated by the vector space on sigma zero. And likewise, we have this cone point sitting out over here that also is um, going to be alternating. So we have sigma minus one and everything else is zero. And if we think about what the map does, it takes the ray to the cone point and the map is either plus one or minus one depending on the orientations we picked. So this is going to be an isomorphism. Um, so this chain complex has trivial homology, right, is what we just managed to show. So we wrote it down and we showed that HK of P2 is zero for all K. And so by that comparison theorem, that implies that uh, the top weight graded piece of uh, A2 is also going to be zero for all K. So great, we've just computed all together as, as a group, the top weight cohomology of A2, great. And so now 
we nab this chain complex and to actually fi figure out, finish the rest of the first theorem, we just have to write it down for all the way up to seven and compute all of the homology and life is grand, okay? But I wanna finish by saying what goes into actually showing that second theorem about the comparison. Um, and so there are two facts that I want to mention. So the facts are um, that the data of n admissible decomposition sigma of omega g rt gives rise to two things. First, it gives rise to a toroidal compactification of AG, which I'm going to denote AG bar sigma. So there's such a thing, for example, as the perfect cone compactification of AG. It's lovely and it's very geometrically interesting. For example, um, a recent theorem of Shepard Brown shows that it's a canonical model for AG for sufficiently high G. And I'll say that this first fact is due to, in various forms, Ash, Mumford, Rappaport, Ty, and your Faltings and Chai, depending on how you want to think about it. And the second fact is that the data of an admissible decomposition is exactly the data you need to do, you have to construct the moduli space of tropical abelian varieties. Is there a modular interpretation of this uh, compactification in nice situations like the perfect, like the uh, perfect cone compactification, at, which is potentially relevant to your second point as well then? Um, so I believe there is a modular interpretation in certain cases. Yeah. Um, so I don't, no, uh, I don't Klaus remember might, it. Klaus, may Klaus may know. Exactly. Yeah, Klaus might know, so I'll defer. Uh, okay. Uh, the, the modular interpretation uh, happens for the second Voronoi. Um, but for small genus, the perfect cone and the second Voronoi uh, coincide. Mm -hmm. But if you want the modular compactification of AG, then by Alexeyev, uh, it's, it's, it's second Voronoi. Mm -hmm. So then the tropical... Uh, so the model is with tro tropical abelian varieties is, wait, you have to choose which, which, uh, which admissible decomposition you need to do to get the modulus with some tropical abelian varieties. So it, it turns out you don't, it doesn't matter. So this is a slightly strange thing. So a tropical abelian variety is the choice of a quadra real quadratic form with rational kernel and an isomorphism exactly again by an, an action of GLGZ. So essentially, up to the isomorphism classes are um, in bijection with the quotient of this cone, omega GRT, by GLGZ. But we need to topologize it in some way, and that's what sigma allows us to do. But an interesting fact is that the homeomorphism type of this tropical moduli space of tropical abelian varieties is um, independent of sigma, and that's essentially because um, if you take two different sigmas, you can pick a common refinement of them. And that common refinement is going to induce an isom a homeomorphism and make everything work. And that, in fact, again, you're hinting at the subtlety that I'm trying to sweep under the rug, Ravi, but I'll say more about maybe in a second. Okay, so with these two facts- But, but, but actually, as long as I'm interrupting you. Yeah. Uh, the, the, so then you should still want, not just up to homeomorphism, but if you take the second Voronoi, because Klaus said that this as a modular mm -hmm. interpretation, you should hope that the corresponding tropical esque thing should have a tropical interpret where the points on the boundary have, uh, should still correspond to something which you can somehow relate to the. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, maybe I'll leave my sentence half. Yes, half I think you're absolutely right, and I think there has been a lot of work gone into understanding the mo uh, moduli space of tropical abelian varieties, um, and. I am not sure exactly what the cutting edge of that is, so I'm going to punt on it, but it's certainly a good question, and um, I think there is some known that I'm going to leave unsaid for right now. Okay, so what is actually going on in this comparison theorem? So I said 
above that we had an isomorphism between the homology of this perfect chain complex P upper G and uh, the, right, I guess the top graded cohomology or top weight cohomology of AG with Q coefficients. And so what actually is going on here um, is well first it turns out that what this perfect chain complex is actually computing is that it's this exactly computing the reduced homology of the, the tropical moduli space uh, with the perfect cone compactification. So, so it's exactly kind of computing the homology of this tropical moduli space. And on the other side, it turns out by work of Deling, or in the case of Stacks, Chan, Galatis, and Payne, that the top weight graded piece, uh, the top weight cohomology is exactly going to be the reduced homology of the boundary complex of AG inside this so-called perfect cone compactification. Okay, and to put it all together, what it turns out to be true is that this, the cohomology of the link of the moduli space of tropical Liberian varieties is then in self in turn isomorphic to the homology of the boundary complex of AG inside the perfect cone decomposition. Um, so really, uh, this is where this is coming from. Somehow the complex we're writing down is actually computing something tropical, which in turn is computing the boundary uh, complex, which is in turn computing the top weight cohomology. Um, so I think I'm almost out of time, so I'll probably end here. But the last thing I'll say is, so why, are, why did we stop at g equals 7 so far? Um, I think there's a lot more to be said, right? This second theorem gives us access to a lot of top weight cohomology if we can only say something about this love, about this um, chain complex P upper G that's very nicely combinatorially defined. Um, and the partial answer is that we're building on a work of a number of people, including Abbas Vicent, Gangal, Sol, and many others who studied a similar complex and were using their previous calculations. The other reason is that I'm going to pull up a table here real fast. And so here is a table that shows G and then the number of top dimensional cones for that given G. So in, as um, Klaus said, for small G, there's only going to be one of them. And that essentially says that the first Veronoi and second Veronoi are going to co coincide. So for four, there's two, for five, there's three, six, there's seven. But by time we're at eight, we're at 100,000. And by time we're at nine, we, know, we don't know how many there are of these perfect cones there are for G, G equals nine. We know there's at least half a million of them. And so actually just doing the computations to write down what all the cones are going to be turns out to be quite computationally difficult. Um, and so there isn't, I think, hope to actually explicitly write down this chain complex in full like we're doing and fully compute the top weight cohomology. But I think it's a really interesting question to say, what can you say? And can you construct certain non-vanishing cohomology in a wide range or an infinite number of classes? And I think there are some interesting conjectures kind of that we can see looking at the data in the right way that suggests what might be going on. Um, but I'll leave that vague and stop now. And thank you all for listening. And thank uh, Robbie for hosting. So we can all unmute ourselves and uh, thank you, yeah.